As a part of this worship service, we will have a time to reflect and participate in the sacrament that our Lord Jesus has given to his people. Please have ready some bread and some wine or grape juice for this time to reflect and to remember. Hello and welcome to worship. This is a celebration of the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. A couple of announcements I want to share with you. Um, first off, uh, at the beginning of September, uh, next weekend, September 3rd or September 4th, we return to two services on Sunday morning with the adult forum uh, in between. So please make note of that. We are returning to two services on the 4th. On the 5th, uh, which is a Monday, the, the following day, the office and campus will be closed, though the Desert Strings are going to begin their fall season on this day, on the 5th. Uh, this is a group that, of musicians who come together, just have what they call a jam session, just various people playing, singing, uh, coming together. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity just to come and share, be a part of that. That's from 2 to 4. So if you want to be a part of that um, on the 5th, uh, the campus is open for them and Desert Strings and for you. Uh, and then as we make our way into September, there's a lot of things going on. And so you, uh, hopefully you can get your newsletter and check all the things that are happening. Uh, just briefly, the Grief Share is starting again. Um, we will have community meals again. Bible study is going to resume on Thursdays. Um, there's a lot of other activities that are going to be happening. So um, please, please, if you have any questions, please call the office. Other than that, I do hope and pray that you all have a, a very blessed week and may the Lord continue to just touch you in, in mighty, holy, and awesome ways. God bless you. We continue as we live our lives in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We observe a moment of silence for reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess before you and before our brothers and sisters that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to us the entire forgiveness of all of our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now join together in praying the prayer for this twelfth Sunday after Pentecost. Together we pray, O God. We thank you for your Son who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example. Point us to the path of obedience and give us strength to follow his commands. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The first reading for this 12th Sunday in the Pentecost season, it comes from the book of Proverbs, the 25th chapter, verses 6 and 7. As I've said before on countless occasions, Proverbs really is that fortune cookie book of the Bible, where you can literally do that wonderful little fanning of the pages, put your finger there, and gain some sense of knowledge and wisdom. Today we get some, again, some very practical words that will be followed up in our gospel today. Again, chapter 25, verses 6 through 7. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Here ends our first reading. We followed it up with the gospel in St. Luke, the 14th chapter, verse 1, and then verse 7 to 14. Many have heard this story, but it truly is that understanding of what, what it is to be first and last, and what's important and what's not important. Hear the promise today. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching Jesus closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, come up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers, your relatives or rich neighbors in case they might invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the gospel of the Lord. Okay, welcome to the children's sermon. Invite all the kids and, and yourselves to come and just, just think about some things after a bit, okay? Here's the thing. Um, when you guys sit down at the table, which I know sometimes you're eating dinner in the back seat of the car as you're driving through McDonald's, but when you sit at the table, I would bet you that every single one of you know where to sit. Wherever that spot is, you know that that's yours. And I don't even know when that happened. I just came back from North Dakota, and, and one of the things, visiting a mom's house. And the interesting thing was, is that I have always known my place at the table. We moved into that house when I was only three and a half years old. And I think about that now, is that my mom and dad put my brother and I, at a very early age, behind, between the table and the wall. And that was our spot. That was what it was. I think about that now, and I think about that's because they could corral both of us, and we wouldn't be running away from the table as if we were on the open side of the table. We were stuck. What's ironic is that every time I came home at every single meal, at every single Thanksgiving, at every single Christmas, even as I became an adult, it was, I always sat in that spot. And it was ironic too that my brother and I, Bruce, it was the same way, is that literally we would end up, because we got a little fatter, we had moved the table out a little bit, but both of us would sit in that same spot. Well, here's the thing. Today, Jesus is trying to examine and have people where they go to sit in other people's houses and where they end up wanting to sit. 
And the thing is, is that there is something about being able to take and know your place, your special place. One of the great gifts that we have is that God has given you that special place at his table, that place that you have mapped out, that place that you have claimed, that place that you have grown up with, that place in that chair, that is the same as how God has claimed and called you. Today, it doesn't matter where you sit at the table because God knows you and will come and find you. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the young people, O oh God. We thank you that you watch over us and, and how our habits continue to be our habits because we have that sense of belonging and knowing the promise that you have given to us. In your son's most holy name, amen. Hey guys, have you played the new PlayStation 5? <laughs> yeah, I played the new PlayStation 5. I'm so good at it. I can do it with my eyes closed. Watch. Well, that was real. Hey guys, are you going to try out for the basketball team? Yeah, I'm going to try out for the, new, for the basketball team. I'm so good at basketball. I've been playing ever since I was a baby and I'm so good at it. I've never missed a shot in my life. Michael Jordan's my friend and he taught me all his moves. I know all his aunts, uncles, sisters, and brothers. Wow, that was weird. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, have you practiced your instrument for band class? Yeah, I practiced my instrument for band class. I'm so good at band class. I'm gonna be paid lots of money to play at people's weddings and to play at bands. I'm soon gonna be on TV with Justin Bieber. Watch. <laughs> Hey kids, I'm so glad to be here with you today. Now, today I would like to talk to you about what it means to be humble. To be a humble person means that you don't consider yourself better than other people. And in fact, a humble person looks for ways to put others above themselves. Now, do you think the boy that we just saw was humble? No, he clearly wanted everyone to think that he was better at video games, basketball, and every other instrument. Now, have you ever met somebody like that? Or better yet, have you ever acted like that yourself? We brag or lie about our accomplishments to get praise from others, and so that others will think highly of us. But as we have learned earlier in the book of James, in 117 it says, every good and perfect gift is from above. So, if we're an excellent video gamer, that is a gift from God. And if we are an outstanding basketball player, that is a gift from God. And if we are an exceptional musician, that also is a gift from God. So if there is any good in us, the glory goes to God. And when we recognize that our goodness comes from God, it humbles us. And we realize, because we realize that we didn't do these things on our own and that God has given us these special gifts. In James 4.10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So let's put God first and he will give us knowledge and understanding and we will be fully satisfied in him. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart who hears my voice and sees this image be pleasing and acceptable in your sight we do pray, amen. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, the risen Son of God. Amen. We're wonderfully in this season of Pentecost where, where Jesus is trying to teach his disciples and the people about how they are to operate. You know, what are those intrinsic things that you need to accomplish in order to take and understand fully the graciousness of God? Uh, today, we get a chance to actually live out what Jesus is talking about, about being humble. And, and it really is a great story because it, it's one of those that we can identify with. Where to sit? Where do I belong? You know the story. Jesus is invited over to a guy's place for the Sabbath dinner. And, and it's a ceremonial type of a understanding of meal. And so everybody is trying to figure out where they are to sit. It, it's kind of like that hierarchy 
of going, uh, whoever is with the host, he is the, the, and those were the most important people, and then it kind of shuffled down all the way to that person that kind of stuck into the door. And you try to figure out, and you gauge, and you figure out the room about where in the world I should sit or not sit. Um, and, and Jesus is just kind of observing, observing this. Well, one of the things that, that I've heard over the days, and there's going to be a couple different ways of going about this, but, but that idea about where to sit, where to sit, and where do you belong, it is really loaded. I know so many fights have occurred, not for the wedding ceremony, not for even the reception, not even for any of the gifts and, and any of those things or vows or anything. I've heard more arguing over the seating chart for the reception. Who should we sit with what? Who is going to get along here? Who did we really think that this group would work? And changing around and trying to figure out that seating arrangement of trying to figure out <coughs> who is necessary, who's in the front, who's in the back, who's the mother, father, the bride, the grandparents, where do they sit, where do these friends sit, where do these, and, and the shuffling that continues to happen in order that everybody will be satisfied, which is an impossibility. But you kind of get the idea, don't you? About where do you belong? Where is that place card? And you look around and you try to figure out, and I don't know about you, but it's one of those, do you start at the back of the room looking? Or do you start in the middle of the room looking at those tables? Do you fear that you're in the front? But again, trying to find and sort where we belong. Jesus is observing the people. And they're trying to figure out where they belong. And, and some are, are taking a seat, and there are no place cards. So you have to kind of figure out who has been invited and where you are in your relationship with the host. Um, when I went to San Simeon, you know, Hearst Castle, William Randolph Hearst, at the top of the hill. I hope someday that you get to see this grand spectacle and this grand home filled with all its artwork. It, 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 he often called it the ranch, just because, and he had people literally just eating off normal plates not fancy dishes, not fancy china. It was really that sense in this grandeur that you're getting out of the city and coming to stay. Well, the table in the grand eating room was huge. I mean, we're talking maybe 30, 40 feet huge. And everybody had their seat. Well, the thing was, is what the guy told us is that he never had, he never told anybody that they had to leave. You know, they could stay as long as they wanted. But William Randolph Hearst would sit not at the head of the table, but in the middle of this long table. And the people that he wanted to talk to and that he was interested in, they were the ones that sat the closest to him. As he continued to grow less and less interested in your presence, you ended up moving back and down the table until you were as far away from Randolph first as you could possibly be. And at that moment, you realized that maybe you had overstayed your welcome. It was a subtle way of putting people in their place. And that's what Jesus really wanted to change around. Because when he was talking about the people, he was saying about how important they thought they were. And everything that they were doing was on an earthly basis. I am an important leader of the town. I should be closer to 
here as opposed to the person that runs the bakery. I think that maybe I should be a little bit closer than the one who has just come in and, and just sat down. And you do that mental gymnastics about where you are to sit. And Jesus pauses and he says, and he says to them, here's what you do. Here's what you do. Is don't go and think more highly than you are and sit at a place that's in the front. Instead, go ahead and, because if you do that, if you do that, there might be somebody more important than you that has shown up and that the host or the one running the banquet has to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, this, is for, this seat is for someone else. You need to move further down. <laughs> Instead, Jesus says and gives this parable of saying, go and sit in the lowest place. You know, that place that's by the kitchen, that place that nobody in their right mind was going to bother trying to fight you for that seat. And wait for the host to come and notice, tap you on the shoulders, ah, you silly goose, you're sitting in the wrong spot. Come on, you've got a place further up front. How much honor will that do than having been told to step down? One of the things is, though, is that by doing that, you take a chance. If you're in that idea about a hierarchy of society, you take a chance that the host will not notice. And you will end up sitting in that horrible seat that literally nobody else wants, and the meal will continue. Well, here's what I always think about that, is when you think about the earthly things, is that everybody's getting the same food. Everybody's getting the same meal. It doesn't matter if you're at the head table or sitting way in the back. Everyone eats the same. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to tell people. That idea about being humble. Having that understanding of how gracious God continues to be. In knowing and believing everyone is his child. And not getting caught up in, in who's more important and who's not that good old rat race because there will continually always be someone who is more important than you. There will always be that person that comes that might be considered more important or higher than you. Well, one of the gracious things that we have is we know our place at the table. And we have a host that pays attention. We have a God who continues to take and realize who we are and how important we are to him. That he calls us, not to some earthly table, but he calls us out of his love and care to come to his altar, to come to his altar rail, to kneel at his altar rail, to worship, to understand the gift and the promise that God has provided through the holy meal that Last Supper, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, all of that understanding of partaking and celebrating in a meal that does sustain us for our life. Not just a temporary flash in the pan, but one that continues to endure, to give us the strength as we continue to live in that promise. Jesus, again, like Proverbs, gives some very practical, practical, just practical advice. But perhaps when he's speaking those words, we can understand what it is to be part of that heavenly meal, that heavenly kingdom, that meal that God himself has prepared for us through his son. That it doesn't matter, rich, poor, important, unimportant, old, young, because we all are in that promise that God has created. Today, know that you have been called to God's banquet, where the most important person that is there is you. 
Because God has reached, claimed, and called you to be his child. Regardless of who's around you, you have a seat. You have a seat at the table. Amen. Almighty God, help us to truly grasp and understand the promise that we truly have the best seat in the house. God, when we come to your meal, when we come and kneel at your altar, we've got a front row seat to the importance of you, your death, your life, the forgiveness and grace that we receive. May we always find confidence in your most amazing name we pray. Amen. Let us now join our hearts, our minds, and our souls in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for allowing for us to gather in your spirit this day. We worship today and give honor and praise to you. And may this honor be reflected in our lives as we honor our neighbor in Christ-like ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, you do invite us. You invite us in pure mystery and grace. And we are not worthy of your invitation, and yet you come and knock, and you invite us to newness and eternal life through all that you have done for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day for all who suffer, who are down, who are doubting their own value and worth. May we share words which lift and encourage. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are in need of your healing presence and touch this day, Lord. Restore the health of those who seek healthy minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. And Almighty Lord, may we always come to know you as the source of all healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day, Lord, that you continue to bless and sanctify your church on earth. We do pray, Almighty Lord, that you please, please continue to bless your ministries in and through the people of Mount Zion and continue to stir your Holy Spirit among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this, Almighty Lord, we pray, trusting in your gracious care and knowing that you do hear, listen, and act for your faithful and for all who love you. In Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. It is in the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. We now partake in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is given for you. And then again, after the supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, Take all of you and drink this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in the remembrance of me. We now partake in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is shed for you. And now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ continue to strengthen us and keep us in his grace now and forever. Amen. Let us now join together in praying the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you God's peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us go forth in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.